thank you for all being on time and for coming along and joining us, whether you're one of our long-standing, almost like ID celebrities now, or whether you're brand new to these meetings, it's really lovely to have you here. Um, and just to give you some background, because I know there are a bunch of people on the call today who are here for the first time. This is actually a little mechanism we started almost a year ago. This is actually webinar 43, and we had a, a month off in, you know, over the Christmas break. So we started in March, I think about March 21 or so last year, and we've gone the entire year. And I started these when COVID hit as a way of just trying to, you know, make a contribution and help people stay on track with being their best selves through what we all thought was going to be an incredibly challenging time. And obviously, as we know now, it's been way more challenging for some people than for others. It's been really quite polarizing. Um, but these weekly webinars have just come to be a real part of our DNA now. You know, people have asked for them to be continued, so we've just kept them going. But we've changed the rhythm so that instead of doing just the same webinar every week, we have a different topic every week to um, just have a different focus. And basically, we do a public webinar every other week. So that's where we have a topic like today where we're going to talk about resilience and build that together, you know, learn from each other on, on how does your ID relate to resilience and, and what can you draw on in terms of your strengths and what drives and motivates you to, to have more resilience in some of the toughest times. And then in the other weeks, we do an ID masterclass. So that's for people who are really passionate about wanting to learn a lot more around the nuances of ID. And the way we do that class is to actually do problem solving together. So, you know, people bring some sort of challenge to the table and we just share it on, on this, you know, in this meeting here and work it through together. And I mean, so much of the value comes from you guys. I mean, there's some very talented and smart ID people on this call and in these meetings and you just really share and help each other, which for me is really wonderful. Um, but it's a, it's a way of really picking up all the nuances too at that, that deeper, you know, finessed level of ID. And then the other week, we do what I call a game changer interview. And I find somebody who um, is doing something that's really game changing, but from a place of being really authentic and in stride with who they are. And to me is a great role model of what we probably all aspire to be like. And um, we've done a number of those so far. And all of these are recorded and posted to our website and onto our YouTube channel um, virtually the same day. So that if you miss any of these meetings, I would encourage two things. One is sign up anyway, because by signing up, we automatically send you the link afterwards so that you can watch it if you weren't here. And secondly, um, you can just go back in and look on our website or on the YouTube channel. The YouTube channel is just Instinctive Drives and you'll find all of the webinars there. So even if you're new to this um, scene today, you can go back and find previous webinars that might be of interest to you. For example, um, just after we got started, probably in about month three last year, we made these videos together on the geniusness of each direction of the of the four drives. So there's eight directions. And together we talked about what's the, not just the talents of each drive, but what's the geniusness of each drive. And even for those of you who were here and were part of even helping build some of that material, I'd really encourage you to go back and listen to that again. Because when you're in a different place, like as you start now a new year with new goals and resolutions or challenges in your work or relationship or kids or whatever it might be, and you listen to that, um, to those webinars, like on the genius one, for example, you might learn something about yourself that you just didn't even hear a year ago, or you'll learn something about the other person. Um, and even if you don't know their idea exactly, you might just get some clues that give you some some direction on how you might tackle things differently and be more true to yourself and help other people be the same. So there's just fantastic resource now on our website and on the YouTube channel um, for you to go back into and just continuously sharpen the axe of your own self-awareness and how to be at your best and always in stride. Um, with that, it's probably a good segue into what we always do on these calls is to start with a little check-in on you being in stride. And I'm just gonna share a slide with you to so those of you who knew can see this especially but this is what being in stride sort of looks like this is how we present it to the world let me just show you this can you see my slide yep we can hopefully you can Okay, so this is showing the green arrow up the middle is you in stride. So all of us have a drive, no matter you know how young or old or experienced or whatever we are, we have a way that we've been 
hardwired to perform at our best. That's your instinctive drive. So it's innate and it's a part of you, no matter what has happened to you through your life, it's always there. The only question is, are we being true to it or not? It's not about whether our ID changes over time. I love that it doesn't change. It's something that no matter what influences have been around you from the earliest of your years, there is this way that you were designed to perform that no matter what influence anybody else has on you, you show up, you, you have a way of showing up and being at your best. And for those of us who even know about this and, get, and still get pulled in different directions, it doesn't mean that through the toughest of times, you can't still show up at your best um, and give your best to yourself and others. That's the green arrow. So when you are in stride with your ID, and I didn't know this when I first developed the ID, I didn't know that there was a correlation between your natural instincts and being in stride. I just found that everyone who was being true to their ID seemed really happy, had their best performance. You know, their health was great. They weren't, they weren't sort of um, interfered with by the colds and flus going around. They seemed to have a, a resilience and an immunity that, that kept them away from those sorts of things. And why, isn't that interesting that when people are sort of true to what their ID says, they seem to be happier, better, healthier people. And yet when people get pulled off track with their ID, they not only aren't happy and frustrated and not as successful, their health really deteriorates. And, and that's what this slide is representing. The forces that pull you off track will always be there. Knowing your ID doesn't get rid of those distractions, but whether you can navigate those turbulent waters better does come down to your self-awareness and how to stay true to your ID. So what I what we do in this check-in is just say to you, okay, this is you know Thursday in Australia, Wednesday afternoon in the US, the week's unfolding, where are you at? You know, if we said on a scale of zero to 10, or, you know, if you can think higher or lower, if that's easy for you, at the high end, the 10 end, that's you in stride on that green line, absolutely fine. A lot of people talk about being in stride or in flow, or, you know, the magic just happens, everything seems to come easy. And when you are like at the lower end, like a one out of 10 or two or three, that's when no matter how hard you're working, you feel like you're just not getting anywhere. You know, it's Everything's a grind and it's stressful and you make mistakes that you wouldn't normally make. So my question is, where are you today? What's your number or where would you rank yourself? Are you an eight, a nine or a 10? Are you a two, three or four? Or you would you say I'm at the higher end or the lower end? It's just good to think, step back and think, how am I doing? Because so much of our days and our weeks, we just tend to react and, and we are really at the mercy of the things happening around us. And with these types of check-ins, it gives you a chance to say, you know, am I going about this the best that I can? And is there something I could adjust to do this even better and be happier and give the best version of myself? So with that, I might just, um, I might just stop and let people share if there's anything that you've, that's come up for you that you'd like to just share with the, the group. Um, let's do that. Whether your number was higher or lower, you might want to share your number in the chat. I can see some people have already started doing that. And it just gives us a pulse without anyone being, you know, vulnerable or interrogated or anything like that. You can see some numbers here that are that are up there. Look at that. There's some high numbers there. Wow. <laughs> 8.47. Go, Greg. I knew you'd come <laughs> precise eventually. These are good. Paul, while people are filling in the gap, I just want to... Uh, so I've said this before, but it's a new crowd sort of. I, I noticed the difference between what might be happening to me right now, you know, like the the MRI for the shoulder or something going on with the family or what happened to Lou. The dramas that might be around me might get themselves a four or a three or a two sometimes, but I, yeah. I'm dealing with them in a way that is the best way. And I've got some sense of, all right, what can you fix? It's not happening now. What What's it? that I actually still feel okay in the middle of the poop, so to speak, because I'm dealing with it the best I can. I'm not going to let it bring me down too. I'm not going to have, I'm not going to have the drama and feel bad too. So I'll let the drama be something I work on and I'm staying okay. And this has been yeah. really tested this last year, seriously tested. And uh, I'm really happy with the fact that, yeah, throw what you got, you know, man, I'm, you know, <laughs> it ain't the end of the world. Come on. That's why that 8.47, if, if I told you some of the stories going on, you go, dude, how are you doing that? Yeah, because I'm not letting that run my life. I just want to throw that. Thank you. Has anyone got an example of that where they might be going through something at the moment that 
you know, maybe either normally or like, you know, a few years ago, you go, you know what, that would have really got to me. But now because I've got this awareness of how to tackle it more in stride, I'm actually doing it differently. And you know what, I'm like an eight or a nine. And, and for at other times, this would have grabbed me and taken me down, you know, like the snakes and ladders, you know, right down the bottom. Has anyone got an example of that that they're willing to share? Go, dear. Um, I said I'm a 10. Wow. Um, and, and I'm, look, I'm always nine or 10. I'm never below it. But yesterday I discovered that it appears that a government department has put out thousands of grants with GST on them incorrectly. Now, my forum verify says you don't bother to check anything, but I couldn't understand what they'd done. So I had to check it and I got a legal opinion yesterday that said, you are right, they are wrong. And therefore I've got to go back to them today and tell somebody in authority that they've made a giant stuff up, um, which is a challenge. But years ago, I, I'd have been, I wouldn't have slept. I've been really worried. How can I do this? And today, mate, you've stuffed up. I'm going to, you're going to have to fix it. So um, I just so what, thought that what's What's different, Gail? What, what, what to you, how do you summarise the difference for you? What are you doing differently today that would, would have been different years ago? Well, uh, years ago, I would have not been sure that I, uh, that I was right. I wouldn't have probably bothered to check with the rest of the world that I was right. I went to every resource I could think of to confirm that I was right, because I'm not taking on a government department and have them say, but you haven't read section 4712. So what I've, I've just got so much more awareness and trusting my instinct, because years ago, I trusted my instinct. I knew what the answer was, but I couldn't understand what they'd done. And so I went to one of the best brains in the country and he said, I am perplexed. So I realized that he was as perplexed as I was. And if he's perplexed, and his job is to give really, really high level advice on GST, you know, okay, so I found it. You just run with it, Gail, it's gotta be sorted out because it's impacting a lot of businesses. And as I say, I might just have backed off before because I, I go, oh, I can't, that, they can't be wrong. They can't be wrong. But I actually now just go, well, they are, and I'm gonna fix it. So, mm. so, so what I so what I hear there is confidence. And for those of you who are, trying to understand ID, when, it, when a strong improviser like Gail feels more confident, it, it makes you almost feel invincible, you know, and yeah. it gives you that, the confidence also in terms of knowing to trust your gut. So when you are an avoid verifier, and, and there's so many avoid verifiers, they know they've got this sense of knowing, and a lot of you are avoid verifier on this call. Um, I'm thinking of someone new like you, Jim, for example, you're an avoid verifier, and you have a very strong gut feel, and a, what we call a sense of knowing, but whether you trust it or not, because the way we're raised, like this is society's expectations, one of the things that pulls us off track is don't trust your gut. I mean, that's, we all have a gut feeling, don't trust that. Go and do your research. You know, there's a lot of people that will get the first quote or go into a shop and the first thing they see, they go, that's it, I want to buy it. But there's this like a parental voice in your head that's saying, but have you gone and checked other things out? Don't make a rash decision. You know, if you make a rash decision, it's going to bite you. So go and check out everything else. And that's because us verifiers are sort of pushing that expectation onto you. But so a lot of people have the avoid verify um, strong gut feel, but don't trust it in themselves. And when they learn about their ID, like what Gail's sharing, and they go, oh, that's what that is. I, I didn't know to pay attention to it like it was that strong a compass. I knew it was a feeling, but I didn't realize it was a strength. I thought it was just a feeling. And when they look back on it and they go, when I think about the decisions that I did where I or made the, that I made, where I trusted my gut, it's profound what's the light bulbs that start to go off. I've had people say to me, oh my God, Paul, now that you share this, you know, that explains my marriage. And I'm like, well, what do you mean? And they're like, you know, I had a gut feel walking down the aisle and i've literally had this from a lady in new zealand and she said i had a gut feel that this wasn't right but my bridesmaid said to me oh don't, they're just the pre-wedding nerves we all get those you know and she thought everyone's paid a lot of money and gone out of their way so i can't pull that now i've got to go through it and she said you know 10 years later as i go through a divorce i knew every cell in my body knew 
And on the flip side, I've had people who have said, oh my God, it explains my marriage. And I'm like, what do you mean? And they're like, the day I met my wife, like, and I think of this guy, Martin in the US, he said, I went back upstairs to my room and ring a mate of mine and said, I just met the woman I'm going to marry. And he said, it wasn't just infatuation. I knew with every cell in my being that we were going to be together, you know? And it's really powerful when you start to learn these things aren't just feelings, they're actually instincts that, that are a strength within you, that if you trust them, they will guide you with perfection. It's not just that you'll get your decisions right most of the time. We say most because it sounds non-human to say you get it right all the time. But when I've checked with people and they go back and I say, so when have you got it wrong? When you've listened to your gut, when have you got it wrong? They go, well, well, I haven't. But, but it sounds arrogant to say that, you know, but own it, own it. If that's your strength, like use it and own it and get the confidence from that. Because as you're hearing from Gail, it really makes a massive difference to how you now show up. And not only will you show up better, but when you think about Gail today, instead of her showing up with any sort of either arrogance or anger or frustration because she's been rocked, when you show up at your best, you can put the focus on the other person and maybe help them have a better experience instead of it just being some type of, you know, conflict that would go on. So it's really powerful. So thanks for sharing, Gail. It's a great example. Anybody else have one that they want to share before we jump on to the next topic? Or anything about your number that, you know, is high today and you're really wrapped about that and there's a reason for it or it's maybe not as high and you'd like to get some insights from the group. Judy, I can see your hand up. I have, uh, after years of uh, working with my complete drive, I've finally just, I don't know, uh, four weeks ago or so, found what works for me because what you know i i i know how good it feels when i complete something but um after being sick last year I, there's a lot in my home and office that are not complete so i would have these big visions okay uh, today i'm going to get all this done you know i'm going to complete that and it was always unrealistic because I'm so optimistic about what I can accomplish. So at the end of the day, I didn't complete it and I'd always feel disappointed. And I just really didn't like that. So all of a sudden it came to me that I would just work in one hour segments. Okay. I'm going to do this for one hour at the end of that one hour, that hour is complete. The project may not be complete, wow. but the hour is complete. That has been incredible <laughs> because then I feel, okay, I completed an hour. Yay, let's go have a champagne or whatever. You know? That's 24 champagnes a day. That's a lot. Yes, it is. No and wonder you're feeling good. <laughs> especially since mine come out of the tap and they're clear water. <laughs> but, but anyway, that has been such a great thing. And I have gotten so much accomplished. That, that's a, that that's, method. I mean, thanks, Judy. That, I mean, when we talk about understanding the nuances of ID, there's a great example of if you know you're a completer, it's like find a way to get completion. Because while ever your subconscious mind, think of it like a little gremlin inside of you. Like I often call it like a little Shrek character, you know, it's sitting inside you. And when it hears, it, when it hears language that relates to it, itself, like the ID, it doesn't really care where it comes from. Like what Judy's saying is I need to feel a sense of completion, whether it's completion around the work or whether it's completion around the hour. And I've never heard that in 30 years. That's a wonderful nuance. That's that, that allows her to feel back in stride again, hear the difference it's made. And for the last few, few weeks, you've been a nine or a 10 duty and you know, you're obviously on a roll. So those types of insights, even though they, what we might think of as a 1%, they're the 1% that make almost a hundred percent difference. You know, that takes someone from like being a, a bronze medalist to a gold medalist. It's only ever just a tweak, but it can make a massive difference. Yeah, great. Thanks, Judy. And, and when something comes up, you know, 
which it always does. Oh, I need to do this, you know, or I mean, these unexpected things. Oh, I need to take care of that. I say, well, nope, I'm on my hour on this project. We're going to drop it over here in this bucket. And I just drop it in the bucket and go on. Good on you. Good on you. Well done. What a difference that's made. Yes. And what you're going to find is, whereas last year was a year of sickness, I'll guarantee you that this year will be a year of not only health, but really great energy, where you just feel like, I've, you know, you'll feel younger, you'll feel more alive, more energized, and, and a desire to want to do more than what you've probably ever done. So it'll be interesting to, you know, hear your perspective on your year at the end of the year and what a difference it's made. Great. My one, my one encouragement to you would be whatever always used to happen, don't use the word always anymore or expect to happen because you're no longer the same person. You know, that whatever used to always happen to you was the old duty. Now with these new perspectives and insights and strategies, you know, there's a new duty at play and therefore this year is going to be a different and much more positive, fulfilling year. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Is, is there anyone who's not as in stride as they want to be? Because this, at the end of the day, I just don't want to move on um, to our next topic without, you know, the, the purpose of this call was to help people stay on track and at their best. And clearly those numbers at, you know, eights and nines and tens, they're wonderful numbers for you all showing up really in stride. But is there anyone who's being challenged by what's going on at the moment and would like to maybe get some insight from the group on a different approach you could take that might sort of help you get back in stride? or more in stride? <clears throat> okay, looks like we're good. Well, I wanna point out one thing, G, before we do. The average number, when we do this pulse, so we call this the PPI, the Peak Performance Indicator. That's that chart I showed you before. The average score is 6.3. So when we do this in Teams or off our um, on our um, platform, ID platform, when people go through the videos explaining their ID, there's a interactive section where it asks you what's your score on the PPI. The average score is 6.3. So when you see the scores on this chart, and I haven't done the average, there's probably some strong verifier that has done the average for us, but the, the average looks like it's you know somewhere up in the eights maybe. And eight is where you want to be. Eight is where you start to cast a really positive shadow of influence out there to the world. Um, that's where you want to be. But these scores, I guess, are really indicative of people having a, a, an abnormal sense of self-awareness. You know, this is a when it comes to self-awareness and knowing how to be at your best, this is a pretty advanced group. The fact you're here means that you care to do that. Um, so these numbers are not what you would find on an average day with the people around you. Um, and when you are lower, not only are people not performing as much at their best, but they won't even be as willing to share because with, with a lower score comes, you know, the sense of fear and vulnerability and concern, that lack of confidence, people are rock. So I'd really encourage you, if you're in a great place, be sensitive to people around you who probably aren't in the same place and they're drawing a lot from your energy. So, you know, it's like a responsibility, I feel, almost a, or a privilege to show up because you're, you're giving more and having an influence more than what you might realize. It's not just about you, it's about the shadow that you cast. Okay, let's move on and talk about resilience. So when you look at the, the resilience topic came up because as we started 2021, when we were about six months ago, I think, and most people would relate to this, we were like, okay, let's get 2020 out of the way. You know, we'll get this pandemic thing behind us. We'll have vaccines or things will have changed. And 2021, we'll be back to, you know, not having to all be in quarantine or working from home or not being able to travel. Things will be different. And of course, we've turned the corner of the year and things are not only not different, they're probably worse. And they're not necessarily going to get better anytime soon. Now, I say that knowing that some people are doing really well and aren't as affected as others. So there is a very broad spectrum here, but nonetheless, the sense of even just working remotely when people thought, oh, I can do it for a while because I, you know, I miss my colleagues, I see them online and so on, but I'm sure we'll get back together. And it's like, no, maybe you've got to go for another year. A friend of mine in the US has got her kids out of school. They haven't, they're in California. They haven't been in school since March last year. You know, that's very tiring 
on two parents who are both working and on the kids themselves. They're teenagers. She's concerned of what they're missing out on in terms of the social interaction. They're trying to make up for it. But it's it's calling for a level of resilience that they maybe haven't been familiar with. And so we thought, you know, we broached this topic last time back on the 21st of January as we start up for the year of would this be an interesting topic to explore of how can you draw on your ID to harness more resilience? And so I have a table that I'm going to put up as a just as a, a thought provoker for our discussion to really talk through and get your reaction of what do you draw on for resilience? And before I share it, I just want to ask you the questions so you can be thinking of it and then maybe contribute to the group based on whatever your strongest drives are. It, something else so you might want to build on what's already there you know like am amplify it um but it's like when you when you think about when i'm really at my you know my back's against the wall and i really got to draw on deeper strengths it could even be athletically you know when you're running a marathon and you're down and out and you're like i've got to i've got to muster some extra motivation here where do you go to get that what does your mind think about what are the what are the principles you live by? Where, where do you go to get that resilience? And is it linked to your ID? So let me show you the slide. And then you might want to share what's starting to come up in your own mind as well. Okay, so this is the slide. Um, I, I can't change my, is there a way to change the view on my, on how I'm projecting this so that I can see the chat? Does anyone know how to do that? I can't see it on the screen here. Top right hand corner, Paul, it's got view options. Where do I see that, Ian? Top, top right hand corner, there should be a button that says view. I can't see it on your screen though. No, I can't. Anyway, I don't want to, I don't want to block the group, but you can see the slide. So just now I can't see the chat. So if someone has a question and you might, you know, call it yep, out to I'll me, that's relevant out. for the group. Um, so these are some thoughts that I've, you know, put up myself and, and spoke to a few people just to get their thoughts on, just to have a thought starter here. I'm not saying this is exhaustive. It's not, uh, clearly it's not complete, um, but I'd love to get your perspective. Um, and if we can hear from maybe each of the drives, you know, someone who's a verifier might say, boy, these are right on for me or, you know, um, authenticate, and I mean either direction, verify, avoid, verify, you know, authenticate, avoid, authenticate. So we just get your perspective in your plain English words on what you draw on to really get your best resilience. And um, let's see if this can not only help, you know, shake this up, but but help others um, relate to this. And you might you might find that as you share, someone else goes, I'm like, that's exactly what I, I do too. Who would like to kick us off? Okay, Paul, I'll give it a go. Good on you, Mike. Um, I, I think for me, and I've certainly had uh, my share of challenges over the years, but I think looking at things as a challenge as opposed to an obstacle, um, always seeing working on the opportunity within that problem and that challenge. And I just, when I saw your slide on resilience where it said no pain, no gain, I got an incredible... Um, impulse if you like about that so there's something there about no game without pain uh, to to overcome pain and, and move ahead uh, both in terms of health um, and, and business so recognizing when there's pain there's always another way to look at things and i, okay. I think just yeah and of course that's a nine and improvise always seeing just being aware of that that need for challenge and opportunity and and turning it around and that's up to our and that's up to a mindset to agree as well and and being not in denial of who we are that's good mike thank you i've got to say i use that myself with the you know, I often talk about Fridays to Sundays. You know, you can't have a Sunday when I think of like the whole concept of Easter. You can't have you can't have the Sunday without the Friday. You mm -hmm. can't have the game without the pain, you know. So it's it just becomes a choice. Do you focus on the Friday or the Sunday? And meaning do you focus on the pain or the gain? And 
if you trust that there's always, to Mike's point, there's always a gain to come from the pain, always. You may not see it when you're in the middle of Friday, but if you just trust that Sunday's coming, that there's always a gain, it lets you focus on that. And it sort of takes what well, makes sense of the pain factor and you just know that there's growth coming. Um, and it is well, always also, about growth. Uh, yeah, and how do we learn? We learn out of pain because if we if we can have a look at the pain and what's happening, we're, be it physical or mental, there's, yep. growth, there's growth and learning from that. So rather than ignore it, take it on board and have a good look at it and then it relates it back to your drive. Yeah. Hey, Paul, Thanks, I was just thinking, since we're probably going to go through this maybe over a few sessions, it, would it be useful to like just start with Verify for right now and ask all the people with a high Verify how that goes, then go to yeah. down and just, just, just check in with the people who really have those drives and see if, that's, if the bells are ringing for them? Thanks, Greg. Thanks, Greg. Let's do that. Um, but just so we keep everyone engaged, even if you're not a verifier, you're either going to be up on verify in the middle or down. But when you, if, let's say you're not a verifier, this is where it's really cool to listen to the verifiers because the one thing for sure is you're surrounded by people who are mm -hmm. verifiers, just like you might be surrounded by people who are avoid verify. So whenever we're learning about ID, even if we're talking about the opposite drive to our own, it's really great to stay engaged because you're learning about people that are typically opposite. And we often find that people marry their opposite. So, you know, like I'd say probably 80% of the time, particularly in first marriages, like younger marriages. So when you're hearing about an opposite drive to you, there's every chance you're hearing about your spouse here. So it's very wise to stay, you know, really alert about it. So let's do that. Let's hear from the verifiers. So let me introduce these to you. Perspective is everything to a verifier. Ver you know, that's getting a perspective and how you reframe. I think we've seen examples of that in prior weeks. Um, the verifier has a natural talent for perseverance of staying with something and finessing and squeezing the sort of the value out of it. Seeing it as a problem solving opportunity because verifiers thrive on solving problems. Um, figure doing what's right, you know, whatever right is, even if it's painful, verifiers need, not just want, need to do what's right. And if it's important enough to you, like if it's a priority, so if it isn't, like find a way to make it important. Like if you were washing the car, I'm just using this as an example, and you were not having a lot of energy about think about how could this be important? Well, it's important by the example I set my children, for example, you know. Um, about doing something, even if you don't like doing it, you do it and you do it well. So when you can find a way to see it more important, it, it lets you be more motivated and more resilient. Does our verifiers, are there other things you draw on to, to harness more resilience? Yes, Paul, I think I can go there. Um, just one thing, the, all, all those uh, you have noted there definitely uh, play very strongly with me. There's one overriding factor, though, and that's um, engagement, ownership. And I think a verifier, it's a bit out of left field, but I think verifiers have got to really own the problem. You know, there might be a problem there, but if they're not, if they're not engaged, if they're not engaged in it or feel respected for it, then and they don't own it, then it's very hard to engage on, uh, on those on. important points. Spot on, Doug. That's brilliant. Yep. Excellent. That's very true. I mean, I just think of so many areas. If you don't first own it, that's a totally. Thank you. Anybody else? I'd like to ask the verifiers where the word purpose like why we're doing it fits in there i don't see that as a thing and i always thought that was a huge thing unless it's in perspective i suppose and it's related to what doug's going like why the hell am i doing this or why are we doing this or why now or why this so i'm just wondering if if um if it's in there and i'm missing it or or uh, is that a, is that am i got the wrong thing that it's important to verify it you spot on greg you spot on it does fit with ownership and it's 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 an ad we will add that in it's exactly right it is a key word for a verifier and it's it's actually key to it's not the same as ownership but it's a big part of ownership so yeah we're, it's a, it's a word that really like talks to the gremlin of the verifier you know it's like wakes that the purpose word really wakes the verifier up I'm new to this, uh, obviously I must be a, a verifier because the verification was resilience. That's what we're working on. So 
that's the purpose is resilience. Okay. Thanks, Jose. Thank you. Anybody else? Um, I, I think this is probably, so I guess for me, I'm not, I'm not really strong on verify, um, but I've come out of a situation where I've had to, like in a cultural context where the culture within the um, sort of team I was working in was very strong on verification. Um, so, and particularly my manager was, and so whenever I went to a, you know, like for our weekly updates or whatever, um, like they're the things that she would go, you know, like let's solve the problem, let's get it right, let's prioritize. <laughs> and I'm like, I need you to just empathize with me. I've just spent like, you know, a week in a factory at, at you know, 16 hour days. I just need you to say, wow, that must've been hard. <laughs> Um, so, and, and what I found in the end was that I, I just couldn't, I couldn't get my energy levels back up. Um, I couldn't sort of build the, the sort of, um, reserve I needed to, to perform at my best. Um, so in the end I had to leave the organization, um, <coughs> But I, I am wondering in, in that context how somebody who's got the opposite sort of triggers either works like in an organized in a cultural context where they're not getting fed by those, you know, the things they need to sort of operate at their best and how you perform at your best within that environment. Yeah, um, great, because to me question. that's part of resilience. Yeah, it's a great question. So you you're moving us into the avoid verify. Let's go there because it's a very it's a great question, and I think very insightful for the verifiers as well as the avoid verifiers. Do we have anyone who's an avoid verifier that can really empathise with what Richard's sharing, and maybe even had a similar experience, but now uses a, a different approach to be able to be more resilient and draw on something to be able to work with that type of manager's style more effectively. So this is Patrish. I have definitely had that experience. Um, and what I found for myself was working with the people who I surrounded myself with. And, and, and I guess it's the collaborating with others helped me to kind of soften it a bit. Um, I think when I look at resilience for myself, it's absolutely, I mean, I, I saw in every, you know, for my down, up, down, up, I was like, oh yeah, today, this is what happened. And there were like things ha happen actually today because I got up not feeling great. Um, that helped me with my resilience and it was something in every one of these boxes. So, um, but for me, I just felt like collaborating with people helped um, and I felt more acceptance that way as well. So those kind of two things helped with that. So the collab collaboration with other people? Like Absolutely. More people? Yeah, working with, like, with the other people I worked with. Um, right. versus just that one person because that one person can really drag you down um, and you're going to have to work with them and if you surround yourself with other people who are and it was it was a leader I had um, and if you surround yourself with other people it was easier to be resilient for myself um, it still wasn't the best environment or a fun environment but it helped me to not get depressed and leave the organization and did it, did it, does it re-energize you enough to be able to go back in for round two type thing, Patricia, you know, and, and oh, yeah. be able to, yeah, okay. Yes. Yeah, because, I, because for me, it's also with the improvise, it's about the positivity. And so I would get the, po you know, I would be pumped up and I right. could go back in for round two, three, four, five, because right. there were definitely lots of rounds with this person. Right. Right. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Anybody else with a, a different approach? I just so want to check with really... Patricia first. Did did that breaking it down like that in round two, round three, does that also give you like a, a new beginning and there's no sense of well, whatever happened in the back, that's done. And you're it's going done in done and right? over. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. with my three, it's like it's done and over. Let's, you know, move on yeah. to the next thing. Yeah. 
Good point, that's Greg. What I'm thinking. Yeah. Uh, even though the person's the same, it's yeah. a different round. Yeah, that's right. a brilliant one. That's yeah. thank you. So, so what could we call it? Because that's a really good nuance, Greg and Patricia. That if because you don't draw from the past, you get there's a resilience by sort of saying, "Well, I'm starting afresh." Like round two is is a fresh round. You know, um, what what do we is it that starting afresh? Is that the the strategy there for that resilience? Like draw a line in the sand and start afresh. I'm thinking because starting afresh sometimes to me feels like a blank sheet, which then it's not a blank yeah. sheet because that doesn't work for me. Um, I don't know, renewed energy, of renewing it. I, I'm going to have to think about that one. And I don't know, Greg, do you have any thoughts? Or anybody else who's avoid verify? Yeah, I'm a five. I have no right speaking here. But um, <laughs> it, to me, it's it's a strategy I use, which I, yeah, well, that ain't, it, it, it's related to this two shell path. It ain't happening now. It makes it all fresh rather than have uh, tendrils from the past. So it's like this, this moment, be here now moment. And that's the way I'm hearing it. Hi, Hi Patricia. I'm one of those menaces. Um, Are you, Doug? Okay, yeah, let's go absolutely. round two. <laughs> absolutely. So, so maybe your seven improvise um you you've you've converted us into being a challenge every time we're there that's true too so that's a challenge nice. to win you over <laughs> this is it it's always for those who are new it's always the whole id that's at work together oh, yeah. all four drives work together you hear us talk about them separately just to make the the learning easier because if we if we do it separately, there's just eight drives. If we put all the the drives together, there's over fifty patterns, and there's like thousands of actual. If we look at the ID numbers, there's thousands of in terms of the combination. So um, it's just easier to talk about them individually. But there'll always be the the sort of the influence of your other drives all working together. That's a great. I'll, I'll think about how we can word that. Unless yeah, anyone's there's got something. Thoughts on it. But Definitely it's a really, something there. It's a great yeah. point. Yeah. I mean, I have I have one for my whole pattern, but I know we're just talking about verify now. What what's your whole pattern, Trish? Because there's a bunch of people on the call with your pattern, so they might appreciate hearing. Yeah. So I can uh, the example is today this morning. I got up. I was not feeling great. I I don't know what it was. There was just something going on, something going on, and I so with my avoid verify. I got on a call with one of my colleagues, and we were brainstorming about stuff that we need to do, and I got a little pumped up. Then my sister came over and we took a walk. So I was actually doing something and I started feeling a little bit more pumped up. Um, I got a call while I was on my walk that somebody needed something from me. And I was like, I can get that to you in 20 minutes when I get back. So that was like, got that quick win out of the way. And it made an impact because whatever I sent her, she loved. So it was kind of like, I used my whole ID this morning. And now I was at eight this morning when you guys asked or this afternoon when Paul asked, what's my PPI? Right. I don't think it was an eight when I got out of bed this morning. Right. <laughs> That's good. That's good. Thanks, Patricia. That's really good practical sharing. Anything else on the avoid verify drive? Any of you avoid verifies want to share in terms of what you draw on for more resilience? Um, Gail here, Paul. You know, <laughs> I know this sounds stupid, but I so often listen to what the, what's being said because I realize I can use it in something else that I'm doing going forward where I don't verify. So I find actually listening to it, although my gut says switch off, is actually often helpful. And then I've got a memory of something that I can use because um, often verifying is, well, I don't verify naturally, obviously. So, um, yeah. So I find that's quite um, quite helpful. I don't know if anyone else feels the same. Yeah, so instead of seeing it for what it is in the moment, you look at where else could I potentially use this and stay listening and yes. engaged. Absolutely. Okay. Well, I've got, to, I've got to be there for it, so I may as well get some um, mileage. <clears throat> That could also be your avoid authenticate that likes to leverage, you know. So again, this is the combination playing out of all the drives. 
it's like okay where where else has this got value yep okay yeah. thanks Cal. anything else what if we move on to authenticate we talk about for those of you who've got the strong you know authenticate drive what do you draw on we've talked about here having a really clear picture and staying staying clear that picture in your mind no matter what distracts you with any turbulence along the way like what's the end goal the end game but having that picture really clearly in your mind focusing on being useful and doing something and doing something doesn't just mean doing something practical even you heard Patricia say before, just being physical, get, starting to be more, if you can do something where you're physical, that definitely helps. So doing something that's actionable and physical is what we mean in the third one. What else? I don't know if this is picky and I'm, I'm, an, I'm an aid in this drive, but I, I, I see the word useful and I, I resonate with that, but the word helpful, it vibrates more cells, you know, like it's a useful is a, a, it means it's helping something work better to me, like, and therefore helping, it can be a person, it could be helping a process, it could be helping my chickens, you know, it's like, but it's, yeah. it's, but I, I, maybe I'm picky because it, yeah, it's still useful. Um, but uh, I really resonate with helpful that I've made, that I've helped. I haven't just, you know, <clears throat> participated. So, so thank you, Greg. That, what, um, just to expand on that for people. So there are like key words that, that drive each instinct. You know, that if, if you were asleep and someone mentioned the word, what Greg's saying is if you, if he was in a deep sleep and you use the word useful, he might sort of like stir a little bit, but if you use the word helpful, it wakes up and it's like game on, like, what do you need? You know? Um, and that's true of every drive. There are drives, like if I said to a completer, um, this looks untidy, that's that's a little bit motivating. But if I called something a mess, then that's really like, like can't be, you know, it provokes every fiber in your being. And so as you learn more about the ID and you learn the words that resonate most with you, you can even use them yourself, let alone with other people. And it does come down to things like semantics and an understanding at that nuanced level, which are the words that attach more closely to your ID. And as you learn them, you can use them yourself to be even more motivated. So these are, might sound like we're just being, to Greg's point, he's saying I'm being picky, but it's actually really important, Greg, because they, they like to, can turn the volume up in terms of your motivation for every drive. A great example. Yeah, uh, just to kind of, um... On, on that topic, the um, for me uh, that being useful actually does resonate uh, very well, right? Like what I've noticed is whenever I'm part of an activity or a project, uh, the more useful I feel and I get that feedback loop uh, that my work is of value to the group um, that really helps me and kind of uh, makes me more resilient, right? I've seen it going both ways where uh, in places where uh, I am not being useful or I've gotten the feedback, I've explicitly asked for the feedback and then I completely withdraw from it, right? Like completely exit, exit the group or activity or if I can find other ways of being useful uh, then I get re-engaged, right? So for me, of, of all the things that are on the slide, that one is what gets me going or completely throws me off. And, and, and Dilip, um, so thank you. What is, is useful as strong to you as being helpful, to, to Greg's point earlier, or is helpful more stimulating to you than useful? How would you rate them? For me, useful is... Um, uh, they both make sense, but uh, I, I, uh, I feel useful resonates with me much stronger because when I'm part of an activity, um, I mean, I want to be part of that activity if on, only if the work that I'm doing is, is, is kind of uh, is being used in a very meaningful way. 
as part of that work or activity. Okay. So if, if my work is, is not being used uh, in, uh, in, in, in a very purposeful way, then I feel extremely disengaged, right? And I, I don't want to be part of that. So both work for me, to be honest, uh, but okay. for me, useful is uh, okay. hits harder. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any other authenticators got something I want to share that you draw on when the going gets really toughest to, you know, stay motivated and, and resilient? So, so one of the things I would just point out, maybe while you're thinking of any extras here is just because these fit with your ID doesn't mean that you do them all the time or think of them all the time. Um, but so, so for example, if you're an authenticator and you perform best when you've got a clear picture, it doesn't mean that you have a clear picture in everything that you do. And at times you're stopping and thinking, do I have a clear picture? Actually, I don't. I'm just doing this because I'm going through the motions, but I'm not sure what that is go get the picture clear and it will really change not just your motivation, but even your effectiveness. Um, the same with being useful and helpful. You might say, do I know, am I thinking about that right now? If I'm feeding the chickens, um, I'm just, if I think of it as a task, it's like almost, it's hard to get motivated, but I think actually I'm helping the chickens and that will change the way you show up. So just making sure that your ID connects to these types of um, words and motivators, um, the more present you are to it and conscious of it, the more motivated you'll be. It's amazing to me how many times we come across people with their ID and they're not performing at their best. And you say to like a verifier, you go, well, hey, do you have a list? And they go, actually, I don't. <laughs> are you working on the highest priority? Uh, um, I actually haven't thought of that. I've been too busy to prioritize today. You know, okay, let's stop and prioritize. And the minute they do it, they go, oh, I feel so much better now, you know? So it's not automatic. That is what this is my message to you here. It has to be, for many people, it's still a, a conscious thing. You heard Judy say before about, you know, just focus on how can I see completion here? Just changing her perspective on that so she links it to her ID really changes the fulfillment and the motivation. Okay, is there anything more from anyone who's an authenticator? Um, I have a question about the do something. <laughs> yeah. um, so I guess um, like do something can be a physical thing. Um, so like in a purse at a, you know, whatever that is, like if you do something around the house, you know, you could do something useful like vacuum the carpet or um, you could do something useful like, um, you know, paint the room or something like that. Um, and at work, it might be you could do something useful like write a report or do something useful by cleaning your desk. I don't know. Um, so I guess for me, um, the difference between doing something useful, which might be just a self-focused activity yeah. versus doing something that... Um, is helpful um the doing something that's helpful to me brings in another element which is the collaborating with others so it it does have more power if what i'm seeking is to do to, to work with others you know like if if right. i see myself <laughs> as doing something useful then it can be an activity on my own yeah. Whereas if I'm doing something helpful, it's an activity I'm doing with others. So great. For others so, is, yeah. so what you're doing there, Richard, is you're starting to combine the drive. So if we play out, so Richard's drives are 4737. So he's down on verify, avoid verify, then authenticate, avoid complete and improvise. So he's saying, I want to do something useful as an authenticator, but as an avoid verifier, I, I'm better doing that by collaborating with other people and I would add, if we want to then play that out for your other two drives, Richard, and if you're doing that, you can do it so you can see some quick wins as an avoid completer, you know, and it's fun. You do something fun and positive. Um, even just the people you're doing it with are fun and positive. That's going to give you even more resilience. So you, you can sort of 
draw from all four directions of your ID to put them all together and go, wow, it's not just, I'm not just like a quarter of the way there by doing something that might be useful. The fact I do it with others, short-term wins and with really positive people, that's like now you're getting a hundred percent of the resilience opportunity, you know? So that's, that's where those other components come from. If you were, if you were an authenticator and a verifier rather than a VoIP verifier, you probably wouldn't have the same drive to want to collaborate with others. You probably want to do something by sitting there and thinking about it yourself. Great example. Thank you. Anyone else? Can we talk about the avoid authenticate drive? For those of you who are avoid authenticators, what is it about that aspect of you that you draw on for more resilience? I have an example here, Paul, and I'm new to these calls. Nice to meet you. Um, nice to meet you. I have a three, so an avoid authenticate. And I yes. feel like the pandemic has stripped us down to the core. Right, where we just have these essential things in front of us, a computer screen, our bubble, our, our home. And so there's been this deepening and alignment process that was allowed to happen because we cut out all the, all the noise. And so for me, resili resilience is about kind of taking away that noise and kind of aligning, but really connecting is the word that resonates with me of, of kind of a deep core connection to those things that are important. And that when the world opens again, somehow all those things that weren't important before won't come back in. There's like a big, big cleaning, a big prioritization that happened. So can, can you maybe expand a little bit? It's a great point you're making. And I know it's right. Um, I just think it'd be really helpful if you can maybe expand on a little bit in terms of with the pandemic. Can you give an example of what you mean by there was all the noise and now you've been able to sort of get more in what I'm hearing you say, I might be wrong, but what I'm hearing you say is it's allowed you for somehow to get more in touch with what's more deeper, more meaningful, like connecting to those more significant, deeper parts of you. Is that what you're saying? Exactly, yeah. Or, or an example of, there was this great article in the Atlantic last week, how there's no more a tier of friends called acquaintances. We only have our core circle that's left. And so we've been forced to really live with and connect with these four people now, not the 20 or the 50. And so if you seize that and as it use authenticate, really go there with yourself and others, you just get really essential and, and, and aligned to your beliefs and philosophies very quickly because all yeah. that stuff is not there anymore for you to distract, be distracted by. Yes. Thank you. Well, for someone who's new, that's a really good sharing. It shows good awareness. So, and like good awareness of your, of connecting with your ID. So Good job. Anyone else? You know, it's a, it's a funny one, this one, like I'm a one in authenticate. You'd think I would have a whole bunch of things here, but I, I didn't have much more. My, what I've got there is similar to what was just being shared and you know, around aligning and connecting to what's deeper and more meaningful. I, I, I could change the, the wording here to reflect better what we've just been discussing, but as to other bullets that um, support this, I, it wasn't as obvious to me. So if someone's got other something else they could share, that would be helpful. And maybe there isn't, it doesn't have to be a lot of things. No, it's just- Paul, I think that, that I was laughing when I saw there was only one point there because I thought you're down there, you're down, case going, oh, well, that, that says it all, they'll get that. Like, you know, like it's all implied. <laughs> and I think maybe it's, um, maybe some of us who don't have that drive uh, can put words to what you guys think is obvious to everyone else, you know? Right, right. Because um, what, I, what I would put there is you, you guys have, when you're on fire for me, what I get from you is is that you've hidden not just a, a deeper belief or philosophy, but you've, I can't think of a better word, but you found a hit, the hidden gem. You found the, the hidden gift in something that there's more to that than it might appear. Like the quick example, my, I was with my, my wife and her brothers and sisters and there, they were walking along this, this beach we were at and, and the youngest is 65, the oldest is 71, the three of them we're having a fun time walking along the beach. And I looked at that as if I was their parents, seeing their children 
at 65 and 71, enjoying each other's company, all healthy, all prosperous, and having a great time. And as a parent, I almost started crying. And I'm like, mm -hmm. oh, Paul would love this, you know, because <laughs> I thought, where the hell did that come from? And that to me is one of the, I run, I want to check in with you, avoid authenticates, is if you've got that, if you know that the rest of us get that hidden gem, to me that you'd have to be in stride. It, it is, it well, I was, you, you say you're right, Greg. Um, I, I don't know how to express it. I just put down dig deeper. And and that is, for me, that is Australia. If I, I'm just thinking of when I was like, if I'm doing something that's really challenging, like whether I'm at the gym um, and I'm doing something and I'm running out of energy or motivation, I, I know if I dig, like go, go deeper, you know, find a deeper meaning to this, then I can muster the motivation. And, you know, you, you'd laugh at some of the examples, I like the stories I tell myself so that I can sort of dig deeper, but all sorts of, you know, um, conversations in my head that will take me to a deeper place in order to have that extra motivation. Um, and the example is exactly right. I, I probably never see, if I saw three people walking along the beach like that, I probably never see three people walking along the beach. I would always be the biggest story around it that I'm telling myself, you know, of like, oh my God, look at that, you know, so how many people wish that they still had siblings at that age and can't do that. And, you know, that when I walk, I, when I walk into, um, there's a shop called, uh, what's it, what's it like a baby's R Us type shop. I forget what it's called near us. You know, when I walk in the doors of that shop to buy something for like grandchildren, I'm never, I never walk through those doors just to buy something for grandchildren. I almost stop at the door every freaking time thinking, how privileged am I to be able to walk through this shop? Like how many other people my age are out there that wish they could have grandchildren, wish their kids, you know, could have had children or wish they could have had children and they don't get to walk through these doors for themselves and I get to do it and I, I just can't walk straight through, you know, it's like this massive moment for me every time I walk in there and I'm um, not this being that many times but it surprises me it, I just done the shop but it's full of emotion for me to walk through those doors because of the stories that are going through my mind um, as I approach it and it's you know what you're what you're talking about with the example on the beach uh, boy I wish I could be that deep I walk into Babies R Us, I'm like, what do I need to get for the kids and get them and get out? <laughs> I almost don't need to walk in. I can just go to the door and stand there. I've had enough. I'll walk out again. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> uh, too funny. Well, Paul, can, can I add a scale? For me, I, I love your alliance, your deeper beliefs and philosophies. But the other thing I've realised, I actually have time. So now I, I've got time to look at nature, which I don't normally do, because I'm always too busy. And I've suddenly started realising what's happening there and how, the, for me, one of the um, impacts of COVID is that I see blowflies. Now, that may not seem important, but for a couple of years, I hadn't seen any because I assume that with all the carbon monoxide and everything else in the atmosphere, they had... Um, gone away but all these insects and things seem to have come back I use blowflies as an example because everyone knows what they are but it's just that with if if I'd been doing what I was doing before I wouldn't have had time to look at that so I bought myself time and I think that that also helps with resilience because I'm looking at everything around me in a much more um yeah in in a different way and I just find that quite interesting it's like taking time to be present. No, they're good. They're good. I think um, so. Additions, guys. Thank you. Hey, I'm really aware we've just gone over time by a few minutes and out of respect for everybody um, who has been on this call, let's just wrap it for today. And what we'll do is next time we do our, our next public um, webinar, we'll finish off the other two drives, the complete drive and the improvised drive. And then this, this slide will get published onto our site as a little product that you can all you know print off and draw from so you've got it there as a cheat sheet. If you're struggling and need to draw on some resilience, you can look at where to go to for you that will continue to help you stay in stride. Um, thank you for being on the call today and for sharing and contributing and just even being here to create the forum for the rest of us to 
you know, um, contribute and draw from. Have a great week, everybody, and hopefully we'll see you again next week. Take care. Thanks, Paul. Cheers.